Okay, Tony Award fans, we've got the uh, the key crew here for you. We've got Ricky Kirshner, the producer of the Tonys. We've got Glenn Weiss, the director. We have our own Paul Sheehan of Gold Derby, who knows more about the Tonys than the rest of us put together. And we are about a, a week plus a few days out from the upcoming show. Ricky, what can you tell us? What's in, what's in the works? Oh, that's why I hate doing these things. I can't tell you anything. <laughs> well, the list of presenters and all that. No, I'm been. kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, obviously, we have Hugh Jackman, who's a fantastic host. And, you know, we've had Neil Patrick Harris for the last three or four years, who's also a fantastic host and, quite frankly, a hard act to follow. But if you're going to follow him, Hugh Jackman's a pretty good way to start. Uh, and Neil's on the show, obviously, doing Hedwig, which is a whole different turn for him. Uh, and we did three or four with Jackman in the past, and we're having a great time with him doing it again. So uh, there's a lot of other great performances that Glenn can tell you about also. Yeah, go ahead, Glenn. Pipe in here. <laughs> go ahead. Just jump on it. Tell everything we can't really talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever you can. In a really quiet kind of way. Uh, look, as Ricky said, it's a great uh, opportunity to do the show with Hugh Jackman after coming off these wonderful years that we had with Neil. Hugh is a talent amongst the, uh, unto himself, different kind of talent. And let's just say we're approaching the show more like a Hugh Jackman show, and we're going to try to really harness the, uh, the the style, power, and energy of uh, of Hugh. Uh, so look for Hugh Jackman a lot during the night um, in, in, a, in a variety of different forms. And uh, other than that, not only do we have every nominated show uh, performing, uh, but we also have uh, some shows that weren't nominated that we've invited to come join us. We have some preview of some future shows uh, that we're really happy to bring, and uh, maybe one or two little surprise things with uh, centered around Mr. Jackman. Paul, for years you've been itching to talk to these guys and uh -oh. to nail them on, on whatever pressing question you've got. Go for it. Uh -oh. <laughs> this is the first time. Go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, first I, I want to say it, it, it's just so great that they lined up Hugh because, you know, we're, we're an award site and this Tony Awards is an Emmy darling and one of the last times that they gave out the individual performance in a variety show, uh, they got rid of that category was when Hugh Jackman hosted the Tonys once. Uh, so I've got to wonder, though, you've got to, you know, one year that Neil was hosting, you had them doing a duet. Tell us that maybe we could hear them together <laughs> on stage, uh, Jackman and Harris, or something. Is, is there, if we keep it tuned in right till the end, maybe? I would we'll say Hugh Jackman will be on stage, Neil Patrick Harris will be on stage. It's going to be a, a heck of a talented stage all throughout the night. And, and yes, Hugh was the last person to win an Emmy, like what's over Tom's left shoulder right now. <laughs> You've got all those awards we have. That, by the way, is the Golden Globe for Ben-Hur, Best Picture. That's the Emmy for uh, Phil Silver's You'll Never Get Rich, Best Comedy Series. I've got a Tony Award. This, wow. is, the, this is the award... I bought these, of course. I was going to say, that, <laughs> that's the one they've been looking for that was stolen from the website, isn't it? That's right. That's that's right. right. Oh, that's right. No, this was bestowed to Richard Barr as producer of the year for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Uh, he also won for uh, Sweeney Todd, of course. Um, and this was a landmark uh, Tony because the Pulitzers had, had... Virginia Woolf was considered so shocking in its day that no one wanted to give it any awards, and it was one of the great moments in Tony's history when they said, we'll rally behind it, we'll honor it the way we should. So they gave Richard Barr this uh, Producer of the Year thing. Uh, uh, hang on a minute. All right, all right. Uh, Let's get the award redesigned, okay? Too many people have the old design. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, right. what were you saying? I've, I've, got, I've got a... Go ahead. I would say they say there's no money in websites. The guy's buying up like every award in Hollywood. <laughs> I know, right? They're doing hey, well. I believe in the uh, uh, Harvey Weinstein school of <laughs> That is, if you can't win them, just buy them, you know. Wow. <laughs> All right, I have, uh, you've been, you've been af acting afraid of tough questions. Yeah. I've got a complaint about the Tonys, all right? Uh, sure. I, think, I think it's the most perfectly produced award show, so I mean this with great respect, and I think that the Emmy justifiably honors it year after year after year, and you guys keep winning that as you should. But there is a controversy that's gone on and may never be settled, and I would like to know where you come down on it, because here's where I come down on it. Isn't Broadway all about uh, honoring uh, you know, plays that need attention and no plays, and productions need attention more than plays? And it used to be on the Tonys, we would see a decent chunk 
of the of the scenes from best play produced, and then in various other years there'd be a montage. Other years they would just kind of throw in a little clip. Uh, what do you say? Where do you come down on that, Glenn? It's it's your job to uh, put the package together. What what's the hope? Why can't plays get their due? Well, I think number one, we try to give plays their due, which is different than putting scenes out of context on a television show. Uh, we are definitely there to honor and uh, respect the entire industry and community. We love the the play side of it, but we also have found many circumstances where something pulled out of context, where the most passionate scene in a play, when you're sitting in a theater, you've had 90 minutes of build-up. You've seen a character go one direction, you've seen him be one way, and suddenly he's broken out of that, and that's why this is the banner moment of the play. Well, when you pull that out of context and you're not able to see all the build-up, oftentimes all of the feeling, all the emotion that the playwright put into it is stripped out. And what we don't want to do is insult the body of work, uh, you know. So sometimes out of context, it, musicals are different. Songs are songs, and they can freestand. Scenes from plays, we've we've not seen a lot of great examples of how something small has stood up. And part of our take on it is we want to approach it fairly. So if there's a play right now that we can put on a scene and it would make sense, but the other three don't. We don't run, really want to unevenly uh, distribute the exposure, if you will. So you know, it's it's a tough one, and we agree with you that it's a really hard uh, part of the job. But we are always eager to present them in, in as best light as we can. Ricky, where do you come down on all this? Well, a couple of things. I think first of all. I've always said that you're the most intelligent reporter on the television world, and saying that we're the best produced show just proves that. <laughs> Secondly, um, oh, in, oh terms in terms of the play thing, is that what you're talking about? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> well, by the way, well, I, have, I, have, I have to give the Grammys a tie. I think Ken Ehrlich has a does a stages a different kind of award show. Um, but what you guys do in terms of a show that has to cram in a lot of awards and a lot of production and the rest of it, you get the balance beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. I knew, uh, okay, so you've always been really, really great, Tess, and we appreciate that. Um, in terms of the plays, we sit here honestly and talk about the play moments as much as we talk about the musical moments. We realize that the true Broadway or theater fan is very interested in the plays. It's just really hard. And every year we've tried something different. Some years we have the actors set up a clip from their show. And some years we talk about the design. And it's also about what happened in the season and how many are still open. Many years, not this year, but many years out of the four or five nominated plays, two are still open. And that makes it really hard to put, put a performance on. Um, I think this year we've we've struck a nice balance, and you'll you'll see on the air that we're very very respectful of what the playwrights do and what they bring to the theater. I'm curious, just along the lines about what's on the show. Um, you know, with the creative awards, the the design awards. I know for a while there there was sort of the PBS precast, and now I guess you present them before the show goes live, and then drop in. The, the winners and brief snippets of acceptance speeches throughout the show. How did you come to that? Because it works fairly seamlessly, but I'm curious if you got much resistance from the different unions and creative... Well, you know, well, a, couple well, a, couple of, a couple of things. You know, as, as you guys have pointed out, we've won Emmys and we're very excited and it's an honor every time. And there's 200 and something Emmys and we show up on the Creative Arts Emmys a week before and, you know, that's when we're told to show up and we win or lose. Um, for the theater people, it's much more important and there's a lot less awards. And, Paul, you, you said we give them out in the pre-show. In fact, over the last three years, we've actually given them out in commercial breaks live on the air. So if you're sitting in the theater at Radio City Music Hall, we are producing a three-hour show as if there's no commercials. So while the people at home are watching a commercial, the people, uh, the design awards are being given out, and they're being given the same amount of time and the same um, respect that any other award is given. Yes, their whole speech is not on the air, 
Uh, we give a piece of their speech on the air, and to their colleagues in the room, they get the same amount of time and respect. And since it's in the middle of the show, not an hour or two before the show, everyone's in the room, and everyone is seeing their speech. And it's something uh, uh, we, we feel very strongly should remain a part of the Tonys because the design awards are as important as any of the other creative awards. Paul, keep going. What else do you have for? Oh, no, well, I, I was saying to Tom before we started, you know, you guys, um, I'm sure you want, uh, Rosie O'Donnell's getting a special award this year, and really, she's the reason you're in Radio City. I mean, Ricky, you go, you date back in, to the 90s when you first started, so when you were first working on the Tonys, I mean, it was in a just a Broadway house, right? It was, you would do it on a, I mean, it, it, sometimes they'd even have shows going on, and the, the Tonys would go in there on a Sunday. I mean, so tell us, talk yeah. about Radio City versus just being in one of the houses on Broadway and what that's meant for what you can do. How... Well, a couple of things. I mean, yeah, you're right. We used to do this. I remember we, we did the Majestic one year when they had a the show. We had Peter Pan, and we would show up at the middle of the night, load in, rehearse, leave at 4, load out. The show would load back in like Peter Pan. It was a nightmare, to be honest with you. And when you got to Sunday... Um, We'd come in at midnight and try and do a dress rehearsal by 8 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, in those days, there's a lot less scenery, there's a lot less going on. So Radio City does uh, allow us to do much more. I think also we've adapted some things we learned at the Beacon um, to use virtual scenery in addition to real scenery to create what we feel is a very three-dimensional world. And I think that the show has looked fantastic over Years and as you guys know, Steve Bass, our scenic designer, won an Emmy for his design last year or the year before. Um, but Radio City has a 100-foot proscenium, and what we've done is create a 45-foot proscenium within within that, so that the shows don't feel lost and they feel like they're on a Broadway-sized uh, theater. So it's given us more seats and it's given us the ability, for instance, you know, last year to bring on a huge amount of casts. And it's also giving us a lot of backstage space that other theaters don't have. But we've tried to make the playing space exactly the same as a Broadway house so that you get the same sense of intimacy you would get in a theater. Well, what was it like to be sort of banished to the beacon? I mean, did you sort of turn that into an opportunity? Because, uh, you know, that was, that was sort of a, a bit of a jaw dropper for us that suddenly, I mean, they'd been at Radio City for, a, at that point, I mean, probably about 15 years. So... Was it a huge adjustment to do those that ended up at the Beacon? Well, it's funny. You use the word banish, and it, yeah. we're not going to argue that point. We uh, Some scheduling conflict came up. We've lost Radio City. And, yes, the, the adaptation to go to the Beacon made us reimagine the show, if you will. You know, we've, all, we've never at that point used screens for scenery. We've, we've always used hard, real pieces and all that. We learned a lot of lessons making the beacon work, and, and we feel like we really did make it work. It actually created a nice, intimate show. We were afraid of lack of ability to uh, store scenery, move scenery. We adapted by building out into the sidewalk and all that stuff. But by using these screens, we came to a new place. We came to the place where in a lot of Broadway shows are doing this. It's not just us, but the, the adaptation of screens that we use on award shows anyway, but not using it in a television style, using it in a theatrical style. In other words, the screens would be there to provide an extra layer of scenery, but not as your only scenery. We still build pieces. We put it in front of it. We created a dimension, a depth, if you will, so when the camera moves, you know, you still have the perception of being in a real environment. And that was really important to us. The Everything Ricky said about the size of Radio City building down to a Broadway scale, all of that has to do with making the television camera perceive the performance as large as it is in a Broadway house. And in, in a big theater like uh, Radio City, you could get lost. But when we were in the Beacon environment and forced to learn how to use these screens, we actually learned a new trick that we brought back with us to Radio City Music Hall. And even though we have all that space, it's another layer. It's another uh, another way of getting better, richer looks for the show without it being an electronic show, with it just you know replicating real scenery. And I'm, I'm curious with Ricky, I mean, as the producer, I mean, you've got two 
masters or I guess mistresses in that it's uh, women that are running the two organizations that put on this show and that's sort of interesting in that you know there's the American Theatre Wing, a not-for-profit and then you've also got the league, the Broadway league, the producers. I mean is it, it does how difficult is it to navigate those two different constituencies? First of all, uh, Glenn's First of all, uh, Glenn's also, also one, of one of the producers, so um, I'm not getting that. And um, you know, every <laughs> client that we deal with, whether it's the Tonys or any other show, uh, the client has some wants and needs. You know, it's it's uh, like you said. I've been doing this for a while on the Tonys, and in the old days, um, the two organizations might have had differing views or differing goals. I think that the goal of everyone is to have the most prestigious award show on television, the show Broadway. Broadway and to put on an entertaining television show now. So I think most of their goals and ideals are aligned, and, and um, we're trying to do the three things I just said. Uh, looking back through the years, what was the worst? You know, nothing ever goes according to script in show business, right? What, what, uh, mm -hmm. what was the craziest thing you had to deal with in a live show? Who wants to answer that? Well, in, in the and, well, I'll just say in the tone is like I said, the we tone, just have yeah. to go into the Gershwin. When we, well, we have to go in the Gershwin at you know uh, midnight on Saturday night and be ready for a dress rehearsal 8 a.m. Sunday and do a show 8 o'clock that night. Um, and quite frankly, it probably showed on the air that you know that was a pretty crazy thing to try, and that's why we tried to find a permanent home after that. But Glenn, yeah, and I was going to say the, the entire structure of it is a show within a show, which I always say, if you had reality cameras that could be backstage on that day, it, it, it'd be the most fascinating thing ever. Because of the size of the show, because of the number of casts that we have, because of you know all the costume dressing and all that kind of stuff, there's actually a whole behind the scenes system that, that the world is not aware of. Like these casts, for example, will get dressed in the theater, not in our theater. And then they'll get bussed over for dress rehearsal, bus back to do a matinee in the afternoon, bus back in the night for their performance. Now times that by the 12, 14 performances that we have, that's part A of the, of, of the craziness backstage. Are you, are you, are you, are you ahead, sort of by CBS needing to keep it, to have it come in exactly on time? Are you given any leeway for how, when it ends? Well, we we have a three-hour show. Um, you know, it's a live television show, and I think the leeway we're given is that we have a certain amount of time for speeches, and we feel we really do feel that the Tony Awards have some of the best speeches, which we don't script, obviously, and they're just warm and heartfelt. And if you look at Cicely Tyson last year, or Bill Irwin, or others. You know, we have a certain amount of time, but if you're given a great speech, we're not going to cut you off, and so that's where our show grows. You know, we know how long a number is. We know how long an intro is. We know how long most things are, but the speeches are the variable, and I think CBS is very good in terms of letting the show feel warm and friendly and not saying, okay, after 30 seconds, play them off. If they're thanking their manager and their agent and their dry cleaner, yeah, they're going to get played off, but if not... We're going to let them talk, and if it's, you know, 11.01, CBS has been very reasonable, 11.02, you know. Yeah, a lot later, it's not so good, but we time a show to get very close, and they know that it's live television. I also want to just follow up on what Glenn said, which is, you know, when he talks about the buses and the things that can go wrong, you know. You guys talk to us. It's really nice. Everyone gives us credit. We go up, we get an Emmy. It's really nice, but there's about... I don't know, 100 people on our staff and another 100 stagehands at Radio City and about 250 to 400 people on Broadway that, you know, make the Tonys what they are. We get a lot of the credit for it, but, you know, I leave every show, unfortunately, the curse of a producer and director. We, we kind of know what could have gone better or worse, but when we leave, no one at home felt that because our team kind of jumped in and made things that could have looked worse much better or just made things run as smoothly as possible. So uh, we get a lot of the credit, but there's a lot of people that make this show happen. And just I think, I think one of the distinctive elements of this show, in terms of an award show, that, that the others lack, sometimes the Oscars have it when they're at their best, but you guys always have it rain or shine, and that is heart. 
there is an, uh, a feeling of watching this show, of an industry honoring itself, a small community. They're talking to each other. They're referring to each other. There are winks into the audience. And uh, uh, it, it's, that's been true throughout the history. But what else do you think distinguishes this show as opposed to other shows? other award shows. Well, you're kind of nailing it on the head. Yeah. The one thing about this world, about the Tony Award world, is that there really is a sense of community here. You know, from the nominations to the show, there's a lot of events that go on with the nominees. Now, you have to understand that folks who shoot movies shoot movies. They go to their soundstage. They go on location and kind of disperse. Same thing with TV shows. The Broadway community, other than people coming in for short runs here and there, are people who know each other for years and have worked together on other shows and now they're together on this show and that designer's my friend and that you know costume person's my friend and all that. So from nomination to show, they have launch-ins, they have events uh, for nominees and all that stuff. I, I, the, the Tonys are kind of the culmination of this time period where a tight-knit group of people already has spent a bunch of weeks getting tighter. So their the, the relationships, the real relationships uh, to each other. And I think that has a whole lot to do with the vibe and the feeling when they win and they're surrounded by their, you know, surrounded by their peers, but really surrounded by their friends and their community. And just on the logistics, I'm curious about how much can you do before the nominations come out? How long are you working on it before you find out who actually is, who your uh, shows are going to be? Well, we go, you know, we go to every show. We try to go to every show before the nominations come out. Some, like this year, came out a lot in the last week, so it was very hard. But um, we, do, we a do a lot of planning, planning especially this year with, with Hugh Jackman, because we knew we had him on board early, and so some of the numbers that don't relate necessarily to nominations, we we're able to work we're on and plan and things like that. But, but I will also say that our our guesses at nominations, you know, anything we guess or try and build the show on the show usually change the night the nominations come out. I got to, uh, we'll sign off after this question. Let, let me have the last one here. And that is, uh, in recent years, you guys have come up with this rap number, which is absolutely brilliant, of course. And every, it just wowed the audience the first time we saw it. And you're still doing variations on it. How the hell do you do that during a live show where things are breaking? Do you have a, a, a couple of rap kids in the basement, you know, chained to a, a wall that just crank this stuff out, and then you run up and how does that work? How do you get that ready during a live show? How does he know about the basement? Oh man! <laughs> now the police are gonna come, and it's gonna be a whole thing. Well, we have we do have one rap kid. His name's Lin Manuel Herrera, and you know. He's the best guy there is on Broadway. He's he's been involved, and as Glenn said before, having Patrick Harris out there doing anything always helps. But it's a machine, and, and just so we're all clear, we have no idea who's going to win any award until the envelopes open. So uh, there, we write many variations. Uh, we change it as the show goes on. Neil would run down and work with the writers, try and memorize as much as he could, hour by hour. As he was posting the show, the guys were writing, they were sending me script copy to look at it, approve, sending Glenn script copy, and then we had a whole other team pulling clips to match the script. Um, but Neil was you know, a master of it, and he, he was great at it and loved doing it. So uh, there was a machine behind him, but you still had to have that face out there pulling it off. And, you know, Audra helping us out last year was a nice little trip. Glenn, I'll give you the last word. On what? No, I'm Anything. kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, on all of this, right. No, uh, rounding off all the thoughts, number one, even you're talking about the closing number uh, in, in the case of the r rap reviews, you talk about the opening number. It's, a, it's our, our philosophy at White Cherry, Ricky and I, when we produce is this is the biggest and greatest team game you'll ever be a part of. You go into this respecting those around you and, and you trust the people that you're working with, you're going to come out with a better product every time. And when we really believe in our staff and our crew and everybody working on the production, ideas can come from everybody. If you're open to it, you're going to make a better show. Excellent. Well said. Thank you, guys. We look forward to this year's show. Thanks for and don't forget, Tom, since you're uh, the uh, Emmy expert, last year's show is eligible for this year's Emmy. I know. And yes, okay. and that's uh, a great thing you've got going uh, every year is that your current show 
is airing at the start of the Emmy voting period for the last show. So it's top of mind, even though, you know, the voters haven't figured that out. They think they're voting for this year's show or something, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, okay. All right, thanks. thanks. Seriously, Tom, thanks as always. Same here. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.